Some murders are so horrific that they live long in the memory. In 1995, Knoxville, Tennessee, such a killing occurred. Victim and perpetrators were just teenagers and the sadistic brutality of the crime caused a media sensation. It would only be after the trial that the truth of the ringleader's dysfunctional past would be revealed. Dividing opinion across a nation, should she pay the ultimate price in the electric chair? Or should the courts show her clemency? This is what happens when nature and nurture create a cold-blooded killer. This is the case of Krista Pike. Welcome back to my channel, my lovelies. Thank you so much for joining me. I've been having a range of backgrounds recently because I'm having some home improvements. Minimal home improvements, but improvements that mean that I just can't be in one position. So apologies, I'm trying to make it more interesting. For those of you who are just new to my channel or have just arrived here because you're having a gander on YouTube, I release deep dive crime content on a Wednesday and a Sunday. Hopefully you will find they are thoroughly researched cases and even if you've known them before, chances are if you tune in to my coverage, you might learn something additional to the things that you already know. Thank you to all of you who are supporting me on Patreon and my YouTube membership. I cannot make this content without your support. You mean the world to me. The same goes for everybody who gives me a like, a comment, and just joins me for a live chat. If you haven't done that on a Wednesday and a Sunday, do it. My community is amazing. Today's case, wow, strap in. I think you're going to be conflicted, and I think there are lots of reasons why I believe that conflict is going to occur. I think whenever we're dealing with young people who murder, it's going to affect you because of the fact that firstly, you remember what it was like to be that age and probably the things that you were thinking of doing as versus what we're gonna talk about that goes on in the minds of certain young people. But also because you're left with that ultimate dichotomy, aren't you? Is an 18 year old the same as a 35 year old? Is their conscience formed in the way that we believe it should be to deserve a sentence that is very, very grave. Do they, at 18, absolutely know what they're doing? These are the moral dilemmas I think this case will pose today. And it is brutal. Not gonna hold back, guys. This is brutal. I felt rage doing this. I felt devastation. I felt absolute critical, critical sadness just thinking about what happened to the victim that I'm gonna talk about today. So let me take you back to 1995. 18 year old Krista Gale Pike. At this point, she's actually a student. She's at the Job Corp Center in Knoxville, Tennessee. Now the Job Corp Center was actually a place that was an educational facility that was very much around working with kids who were what were considered troubled. They were children who were considered challenging teenagers. Now Pike, fits this very appropriately. She'd had a really, really troubled upbringing. We're always gonna look, aren't we, at the ingredients list of what creates these killers. And it's essential as far as I'm concerned to navigate whether things could have been different if an individual had been exposed to a different life experience. When we talk about Pike having a troubled upbringing, I mean, there is a tick box on every worst case scenario you can imagine for a child. And this culminated in her eventually dropping out of high school. I am going to sound highly judgmental here, but then why change my particular character just for this video? We all know there are certain judgments that I place, particularly on parents. And I genuinely believe the world would have been a better place if her mother, Carissa Hansen, had literally been sterilized. I don't believe she should have ever had the right to birth children. I don't feel that she deserved that honor and privilege. She certainly didn't embrace it by any stretch of the imagination. She was a horrific mother. 
She was so much more interested in herself. She was so much more interested in partying and just pleasing all of her numerous partners. They were always the priority. And it really didn't matter what kind of partners they were, whether they were violent, whether they were abusive, what mattered were they were partners and they absolutely served a purpose above as far as she was concerned, the relationship with her child did. So she didn't look after her children at all. And this begins basically in utero because before Pike's even born, she suffered serious brain damage essentially because her mother had this completely hedonistic lifestyle. Now we can all appreciate that some women do not know they're pregnant and they may be dependents, they may live chaotic and difficult dysfunctional lives, and there is damage done to the fetus that's developing because the parent really doesn't know what's going on. This is not the case where Pike's mother is concerned. She knew she was pregnant, she really didn't care. It was far more important to her to be partying and just inviting different men into her world than to think about cultivating an environment that would be good for her unborn baby. Now, Carissa, her mother, she, like her own mother, was an alcoholic, so we see this pattern. And again, we can always have a level of empathy for dependency. People often are trying to escape awful pain and they're using it to anaesthetize the agony that they feel inside. We can all agree that that is something that happens, but this is impacting on a child. If you are pregnant, then you lose the right to do that. This is no longer your body. You are symbiotically connected to the child. What you do to you affects them. And therefore, as far as I am concerned, as soon as you know you're pregnant, there is an expectation of behavior. And I'll put this into the context that I've covered Joanna Dennehy, the UK's most notable female serial killer. And even she, who was a very, very dependent individual, gave up alcohol and drugs during her pregnancies. It is possible but clearly in this case, Carissa was incredibly self-indulgent and selfish. So she drinks all the way through her pregnancy. And this is so serious that she actually damages Pike's frontal lobe. And this, as I said, is while she's still in utero. And the problem is damage to the frontal lobe means because it's the area of the brain that controls amongst other things, behavioral regulation, that people will often, when they have that particular specific damage to that area, struggle to even consider consequences. So, what we see in Pike early on is she finds it really difficult to regulate her actions, her behavior, all the way through her life. And when people talk about frontal lobe damage, sometimes it's assumed because somebody's had a serious head injury and therefore the change in behavior, even if you can't necessarily see it on an MRI, it's assumed. But in this case, we're actually talking about damage that was so severe to that area of the brain that it was visible on an MRI. So this is a real, real impairment. And it was so serious that as a child, Pike was suffering from seizures. So this demonstrates the most imperfect environment for a child to be born into. But additional to that, we have a child who's already impaired when she's born. She's had no control over that. This has happened to her because of terrible mother. So Pike gets this really, really bad start in life. She's born with this problem, and that means that she's already setting off behind the starting blocks, essentially. Because when you think about comparative peers, if they haven't got those problems, they're gonna be in a different space, they're gonna developmentally find it more easy to succeed in places like school, even peer relationships, because you know, we really don't like people who can't control their anger. If there is one sure thing that's gonna cause problems with peer relationships, it's the person who's explosive, because you scare me. I'm a four-year-old, I don't need to be around that stuff. And unfortunately for Pike, that would be present and prevalent in her life. Also, if a child struggles with their impulses and consequences, their behavior is often bad. And the consequences, if you're being brought up in a really imperfect scenario where you're not really cared for, you can absolutely bet your bottom dollar that the adults around you are gonna use your behavior to punish you. So as opposed to being seen as the victim in this circumstance, you're gonna be seen as the aggressor. And that's gonna additionalize all the problems that I've just talked about. So she's born this way, she's completely neglected by her mother, and she goes on to suffer so much abuse as a child. Now, her mother, as I've said, who is horrific, I'm not gonna dress this up, I'm not gonna feel sorry for her, I'm not gonna give her excuses, the mother deserves harsh judgment beyond belief as far as I'm concerned. So as well as her being an alcoholic, 
She's also incredibly emotionally abusive to Pike. And let's be honest, there are lots of dependents out there who would never raise a hand towards another human being. They would never abuse another human being. They abuse themselves. But her mother looks for an outlet, so she's quite happy to use that against her daughter. Now, I do understand that because of the alcoholism and because of her own upbringing, she is to some degree somebody who has her own personal demons. Very troubled woman. She was very depressed. She actually did try to take her own life when Pike was three. But again, when you have a kid or children, you have to think about their needs before yours. We're not talking about a woman who makes great efforts to bring up her children effectively. And because of the awful experiences and history that she's endured, she falls short. We can have total sympathy and empathy for that. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a very self-centered individual who really doesn't care at all about her kids. So throughout Pike's childhood, Carissa's sole focus is on herself. She's interested in partying, she's interested in her partners, and she's very interested in her own appearance. That's what mattered. And I will go so far as to say, from what my research has evidenced, Pike's existence was an inconvenience. She was just somebody who saw Pike as somebody who maybe added problematic experience to her life and she projected that inconvenience very heavily onto the child. So aside from all the things that I've talked about with Pike's very, very challenging early childhood, it's also marred with instances of repeated sexual abuse. In kindergarten, her teacher actually reported, I mean, this demonstrates the kind of teacher that she had as well, because my God, red flags are often ignored, but not by this teacher. She realized that this kid, this child, is drawing pictures of penises. Now, when you do safeguarding, and it's something that I've taught, and it's something that I've been involved in my career, what you look for are these red flags. And children being overly physical with people who are strangers, that's often something that gives us a real wake up and we think this isn't right, this behavior seems too intimate, this child shouldn't be acting in that way around strangers. If children are writing things that are inappropriate and sexually motivated, if children are drawing inappropriate material and it's of a sexual nature and they're young, because it's out of context with what you expect, certainly it will draw your attention. And this teacher is that concerned that she does actually report it. So this is highly indicative that she's having very early sexual experiences and abuse. And that in itself is devastating to think about. This little kid in kindergarten, so exposed to inappropriate circumstances that she's actually drawing that out because to her, it's just normal. She hasn't got the cogency, the understanding of what's happening to her. She's just writing down or drawing what is real in her life. Now at this point, counselling is recommended, which you would think any parent would want. Geez, if somebody is telling me that my kid's drawing images of penises, I'm going to be like, something is going down and I need to get this sorted, but not her mother, no. She just didn't bother, didn't follow through with it. It wasn't important to her where Pike was and how she was feeling or what was happening to her. And that in itself, again, further compounds my viewpoint on Pike's mother. Also, because she was such a neglectful parent, she basically went out of her way to just unload her kids on other people, any other family members that she could push them off on. So for the first three years of Pike's life, she basically was pretty absent. She just prioritised her multiple husbands over Pike, and that meant that Pike was giving this constant reinforcement that she wasn't really that important. She could be picked up and put down by whoever basically wanted to attend to her positively or negatively. She fully prioritised her multiple husbands over Pike. So when Pike was eight, this is when Chris is on husband number four, he basically goes ahead and announces that he doesn't like children. I'm going to throw it out there. I think probably before you marry somebody and you have kids, there's probably ultimately a question you'd have to ask them. Do you like kids? No, I can't stand the little blighters. I'm not sure this engagement's going to work out. That's where you'd be. Hopefully prior to the engagement, with respect, probably fast forward it a little bit, imagining a kind of whirlwind romance. But the truth is, if you're with a guy who says, I really don't like kids, you're like, well, there's the door. Don't fall over as I push you out. But this isn't what Carissa's like. So because he doesn't like kids, 
that means that he can legitimately be nasty to those children. He's confided in Carissa, this is how I feel, I don't like it. And he actually frequently whipped Pike and her sister with a leather strap. Let that sink in. This guy isn't even the father and he thinks he's got the God-given right to abuse these children in such a way. Obviously, a biological father wouldn't have that right either, but it kind of demonstrates the level of territory and arrogance this individual has, that he feels that he has a right to take a leather strap to this child and these children. And with respect, if that was me as a parent and I saw my stepfather to my children doing that, the least of his worries would be being whipped in return with a leather strap. He just have to hope really, really deeply that he can run faster than me and run faster than the rest of my family who would be chasing him down like a marauding tribe. Now, this is all going on. Now the kids are being abandoned and rejected and their attachment issues are going to be huge because, of course, no one's protecting them. Now, rather than actually get up and leave this abusive man, Carissa thinks, well, there's an easier thing that I can do. I can unload my children elsewhere. Simple as that. I'm not going to acknowledge that I've got a job to do. I'm not going to acknowledge the detrimental impact that me choosing a man over my children is going to have long term on these kids. No, I'm just going to ship them off. However, stroke of luck, a real stroke of luck, because as God would have it and as fortune would have it, Carissa actually sent Pike to live with her paternal grandmother. And let me tell you, that grandmother would prove to be the only source of stability in Pike's dysfunctional life. That transition to live with her grandmother, to be shipped off there, often meeting children who you don't really have a relationship with, and suddenly feeling that you're the primary carer, could understandably cause concern, frustration, resentment, anger, but not with a grandmother. Her grandmother genuinely cared for her welfare, genuinely loved her. She was an angel. She genuinely had the best interests of Pike at heart. And she would have been a dutiful and loving parent to her. But just like in Pike's life, up to this point, things don't work out for her that way. And sadly, her grandmother died of cancer when she was 12 years of age. Now, that had a profound impact because this is the woman that saved her. This is the woman that made it easy for her to feel loved, to feel accepted, to feel a sense of connection, to relationally connect with this woman who didn't have to love her, but just chose to love her and make her feel safe. And she had to watch this icon, this mentor, this matriarch just waste away from cancer in front of her. Apparently, the impact of her loss was so profound, so great, that she actually went into a state of disassociation and amnesia when she died. It was so impactful. So Pike loses the game. Now that her paternal grandmother is dead, Pike just gets passed around. She's left in the care of other family members and unfortunately we revert to type. They're just as neglectful, just as abusive as her awful mother. And if I'm going to be honest, from what I can tell, in reality, she was basically just left to raise herself. So she's passed between her mother and father. There's no consistency. There's no security. And bear in mind, she's also dealing with profound grief and loss. And it's not just a loss of the love of a woman that she had felt safe with. It's the loss of her security, her foundation, her chance at what could be considered a normal relationship, at what could be considered a wholesome future. And now she's back to being passed from pillar to post. She's at her mother's home, which is really filthy. And her mother was so chaotic and so neglectful that she never had any boundaries for her daughter. She just allowed her to do whatever she wanted. And we know that that makes a child feel deeply insecure. Okay, when you're a teenager, you might think it's great that your mum lets you drink or smoke pot or grow weed or go out till four o'clock in the morning or have sex with people. That might feel as a teenager or a young adolescent that it's something that sets you aside from your peers. You don't have to stick to the rules and so on and so forth. But actually what it translates as is you're not that cared for. And that's a deeply woundful to the psyche. So these rules and boundaries just don't exist. Now, Pike's own aunt said that as far as she was concerned, looking back on Pike's behaviour, it was around the age of 12 that she was just completely out of control. Her mother, although I'm not sure that we believe her mother with respect because 
how would she know what Pike's behaviour was like? She didn't actually pay her any attention. But she said that it was around the age of eight that she was out of control. She also pointed out that apparently Pike grew cannabis in pots in her mother's home from the age of nine. I'm just going to throw it out there. If your child is growing cannabis in your home at the age of nine, all you have to do is throw the cannabis plants out. It's not rocket science, sweetheart. Just go ahead and remove them. But that would actually involve her mother having some kind of activity and action within her life. And why break the habit of a lifetime when you can just carry on being absolutely useless? She also, as a mother, recalled that apparently Pike exhibited some unusual behavior. This is what she noted was unusual. She said as an older teenager, she used to play dress up and with Barbie dolls with her 11 year old cousin. I'm gonna be honest with you, that is not massively unusual behavior. And certainly when somebody has dealt with massive emotional blows, escaping into a world of play is not unusual. I appreciate that her mother's trying to say there was something odd about the way that she interacted with the world. But hey, when you're emotionally battered and broken, you'll find escape pretty much anywhere. And with respect, this is not necessarily an antisocial behavior at all. It's something that she's playing with her 11 year old cousin. And like I said, when you've had no childhood, playing with dolls and dressing up and escaping can be a very alluring experience. Now, following the breakdown, of course, the breakdown of a mother's fourth marriage, her subsequent boyfriend that she picks up quickly goes ahead and beats Pike with a belt again. So we just have this traveling between awful men who are just using Pike is a beating opportunity. In fact, this guy, this piece of work, this excuse for a human being, he would literally be so into actually abusing her that he'd wake her up in the middle of the night to beat her up. And then of course, it wasn't just gonna stay there, was it? It wasn't just gonna be the beatings, which is horrific enough. No, the physical abuse becomes sexual abuse. He used to twist her nipples, used to touch her up whilst wrestling with her. You know, just so, she couldn't be sure whether it was okay or not because she's been used a lot anyway. So she's questioning whether this is normal in relationships. And then if you can kind of create a game, if you can do something attentional and then happen to start being sexually abusive within that, it makes people confused because you don't know whether it's actual sexual molestation or whether they were just playing. And this guy knows that. He knows it and he uses that against her. She's confused enough already. Now the abuse only actually ended where he's concerned after he is charged for punching Pike in the nose. Only at that point. And at this point, Child Protective Services order that he can't be alone with her. Again, that is not enough. If a male who is grown and an adult punches a young girl in the nose, he should never be allowed around her again. I think it's really strange when Child Protective Services say, oh well, you can still be around her, just not alone with her. Because we all know that if you're living in that chaotic experience anyway, the parenting is not good, why would you ever consider that that kind of advice is gonna be adhered to? It's not going to be adhered to. Now, when left in her father's care, because as I said, she's moving between one and the other, Pike's again just subjected to this constant abuse. So when Glenn Pike wasn't actually neglecting her, which he did very, very often, again, the physical abuse is massive. He'd whip her as much as six times a day, and the whipping was so bad that he'd end up leaving scars on her back. And it's not enough that he's carrying out this horrific physical abuse. He throws her out of the home on two occasions. So. It's not a secure base, it doesn't feel safe, it's abusive anyway, but it doesn't even have the consistency of her being allowed there without the threat of losing the opportunity to stay there because he just throws her out willy-nilly. Now on one of those occasions that apparently he threw her out, what was alleged was that she'd sexually abused his two-year-old daughter, which was from his second marriage. If that 
happen. That is absolutely heinous. But I think we also have to acknowledge that if she's had horrendous abuse her entire life and she's got sexually blurred boundaries and she doesn't really know what's happened to her, the behavior that plays out is often to do with that horrendous confusion as opposed to her being a sexual predator. That noted, it's absolutely possible that people who are horrifically abused can also develop into sexual predators. It's rare, but it does happen. But I think it makes sense that she probably has a great deal of confusion around what's appropriate to do with children considering her background. Not minimizing, I'm not excusing it, but I think we have to look at explanations for this kind of projection. And if this dysfunction and chaos isn't terrible enough within all these relationships that I've just talked about, when she goes to her maternal grandmother's care, it's, let's just put it on the table, nothing like her paternal grandmother's care, which was wonderful. No, in that particular residence, she suffers loads of physical and verbal abuse because, of course, the grandmother is as well an alcoholic, just like her daughter. So Pike's grandmother felt similarly to how her daughter felt about being a mother. She resented Pike. She really resented having to care for her. She felt it took away some of her alcohol time. And she actually was such a serious alcoholic with respect that she died of alcoholic hepatitis. This is not me being cruel. I appreciate that alcoholism is an affliction. I appreciate that people do not choose dependency. I still stand by my belief system that if you are not capable of being around a child, if you are violent, if you're abusive, if you are a dependent who knows that they resent the child to a point where they're gonna do them damage, just say no. Carry on with your alcoholism, it's awful, but just say no to looking after a kid because you're gonna damage them. And that's the thing throughout this thread. No one cares about the impact on Pike. And when we're looking at the ingredients list of possibility, then my God, we have to look at how we activate killers. And this far, let's be honest, it seems pretty clear that on a nurture level, it's non-existent. And we already have the nature level in the fact that she has impairment to the frontal lobe. So all of this is going on. And then Krista ends up, spending time with her maternal grandfather. I will note, her maternal grandfather is not someone who seems to have notably been involved in any kind of abuse towards her, but there's trauma, repeated trauma. So she might not have been being abused in a physical, emotional, or neglectful, or sexual way, but some of the activities that he's involved in just will affect her because she witnesses him slaughtering, skinning and cutting up animals. And some of those animals she's actually become attached to. She'd even named them. Now, I appreciate that everybody has a different point of view. Personally, as a family, we don't eat any animals and we aren't involved in the killing of animals. But I also know that people hunt and that people really take great pride in killing their own animals and eating their own animals. I'm not judging. I'm just saying that if you're a child and you've already had all of this horrible experience and then you kind of attach yourself to animals and you name them. And let's be honest, animals are unconditionally loving. Pigs are the fourth most sentient beings in the world and cows are incredibly loving to be around. Chickens are like dogs when they're born and they see you because of imprinting. There are all these reasons why animals can become a family that you've never had and you know what, they're not going to abuse you. So for Pike, she's got these relationships and then those relationships are not just murdered in front of her, they're skinned in front of her. So that's trauma and that additionalizes what we're talking about. And remember, when we look at people who are serial killers, for example, we look for that thread what is the 360 degree trauma that these people have experienced? So Pike's seeing that now. Now I think I've made it clear up until this point that sexual abuse is literally a constant feature in Pike's life, constant. So before she's even a teenager, we have a neighbor sexually assaulting her. He actually pushes her into a weed patch, holds her down, rapes her, and this is all while she is screaming. And this isn't alleged. This individual actually agreed to plead guilty. Yes, he pled guilty to a lesser offense, but that would be essentially so that they definitely got a conviction. But we can tell this happened. Pike is exposed to this horrific violence. And again, a man abusing her in this way as a young person. Despite this, despite this poor girl being raped, as a young teen, 
Pike's mother basically refuses to believe it. Didn't acknowledge it. Wouldn't accept that her daughter had been raped. Because of course, she doesn't see Pike as an actual person with meaning. So why would you care about what happened to her? So this is something that's a clear messaging from her mother. You have no worth and I don't believe you. Think about the psychological distress this child has been through. Now, after that awful rape, she actually tried to take her own life. And I think we can all have complete sympathy and empathy for her because she feels absolutely worthless. She's basically been used and abused by everyone. And even when the police actually catch her predator, it's not enough for her mother to care. Even a judge and jury can't make a difference to her mother's opinion. She's totally abandoned by her. So that wanting to take her own life, I think we can all understand why escaping permanently, probably in that moment, felt better than what she's facing on a day-to-day -day basis. And the sadness and level of trauma and despair that she must have felt as a young person to want to do that, again, it demonstrates the fact that we have somebody really, really struggling. Now, age 17, she has another further sexual assault. This is when she's walking down a street and she's just attacked by a stranger. This is at night. He drags her up a hill by her hair and he rapes her repeatedly again and again. He's hitting her head all the while against a rock. So we've got more brain issues there because constantly being hit against a rock and violence is going to absolutely have an impact, particularly when you've already got this impairment. And that attacker only actually fled when they were disturbed by a passing car. So this has happened to her again. Her vulnerability is oozing, isn't it? Absolutely oozing. Remember what predators do. They look for people who are vulnerable, available and desirable. You can't control desirability, absolutely not. But the vulnerability and availability, you know, she's walking by herself. There's clearly a vulnerability in the way that she acts and seems and the world should be a safe place for anybody, no matter how they're walking, no matter where they're going, no matter what they're wearing. But these predators exploit these kind of circumstances. And I bet that she was oozing that vulnerability because of this horrible, heinous experiences she's previously had. And her mother just wouldn't even acknowledge that reality. She didn't care. It doesn't matter that her daughter's been raped and beaten really badly. And I believe that if that passerby hadn't have gone and actually disturbed them in that car, likelihood is that she'd probably been killed. It's really unsurprising to me that down the line, not at this point, but down the line, Pike actually ends up getting diagnosed with bipolar, disassociation and PTSD. But what I'll tell you at this point is all that is established way too late. I mean, way too late. So we are looking at this information coming to fruition in reality at a point when it's useless. It really is. Now this traumatic childhood that she had endured survived somehow, albeit clinging on by her fingertips, it led to a lot of different issues. So she had really severe sleep deprivation. Because you can imagine, can't you, if you've got PTSD as a young person because you're dealing with the horrors of what have happened and when night has become an enemy, going to sleep will be really, really difficult. She was also known to have this really reckless, impulsive behaviour. Again, she's got the frontal lobe damage. Also, she was known to have very poor judgement. Yeah. Makes sense. Her primary carers have been absolutely BS and she hasn't had foundations of security bar that wonderful Nirvana time with her grandmother. The rest of it has been a place where everything in the world is unsafe. How on earth are you going to be able to regulate your emotions or actually know where you should go, how you should be, what you should do? They're all the things that you need to kind of be taught either by your friends and family or by society, but no one's raised this child apart from that very short period with her grandmother. The rest she's been fending for herself. There's a feral nature. So this impulsive behavior and poor judgments to be expected. And none of these issues that are obviously very obvious, you know, in kindergarten, her teacher's saying there's something wrong here. Even when you think about her father who threw her out and he was horrible, the point is he's still notable some of these issues that they're noting about her behaviour, concerning actions. Why hasn't she been put in counselling? Why hasn't she been assessed properly? And it's because people just didn't care enough about her. She never got it treated. And 
as I said, to top everything off, we have organic brain damage suffered in utero. Cooking pot of possibilities on the absolute boil right now. I think another thing that can evidence Pike's poor judgment is the choice of partner that she goes for. So when she's 17, she becomes absolutely obsessed with this very severely disturbed former psychiatric patient and this particular person staying in her mother's house. With respect, again, I know that if you were a severely disturbed psychiatric patient who has had problems and struggles, I am not blaming you for that. You absolutely need to be cared for. You absolutely need a safe place and a safe space. You need to be in a nice environment, not with some chaotic alcoholic. But also, if you have kids, you really do have to think about whether a severely disturbed psychiatric patient is the kind of individual you want around your children, not because they don't deserve care and compassion, just because of the chaos and the risk that may pose. But nonetheless, when has a mother cared about that at all? But for whatever reason, Pike really connects with this person, really connects with them, this intense attachment. And I think that when you look at attachment disorders, what you know here is when you haven't had a secure attachment, when you've had a very violent attachment, when you've had a very neglectful attachment, a very abusive attachment, a very inconsistent attachment, it makes you crave connection, it really does. And an intense attachment style is literally typical of people who've experienced neglectful childhoods. For those of you out there who have yourselves dealt with horribly abusive childhoods, you'll know what I'm saying. You'll know that when somebody shows you some kind of attention and connection, it means so much. It's so loud. It's so amplified because you haven't had it. And if you're lucky, you get to be with somebody who is caring and cultivates a compassionate experience for you and makes you feel safe and helps to heal those wounds within you. But that's not how it works out for a lot of people because you attach in the wrong space. So she starts this connection with this particular individual. And when a mother and her mother's fifth husband, I kid you not, kicks him out and Pike follows and she ends up actually living rough on the street with him for months. That's how desperate she is to connect. She'd rather be on the streets with this guy who's got big problems than be at home with her mother because he probably throws her a shred of attention. And that shred of attention means more to her than what she's experiencing stroke enduring in her abusive home. Now, as I said right back at the beginning, we're dealing with a 17 year old Pike who's a student at the Job Corp Center Remember, this is a place for troubled young people. And Pike meets a 17-year-old guy called Tadrell Ship. Now, Ship is an individual with quite a challenging history. So he's a gang member, he's got a history of violence, and we can all appreciate that people join gangs for a range of reasons. And, you know, it would be neglectful or remiss of me to say that people are joining gangs because they want to kill people or they wanna be gun runners and drug runners. I think reputation plays a big part of it, don't get me wrong. You wanna be respected and you get that through gangs. But I also think if you don't have a level of belonging and connectedness in your life, then these older males, and it is primarily older males, can actually serve you with a sense of meaning. Yeah, you're gonna to have to do some horrible things for it, but at least you're not alone. So I'm not defending gang culture at all. I'm just trying to empathize with the reasoning behind why some people go into it. And just because somebody is a gang member doesn't mean that they are a horrible, heinous human being. Sometimes it's just that they have no role models. They want males in their life to make them feel safe and they go in a direction where they can achieve that, albeit it comes with a criminal intent. But this guy has got some pretty big malevolence running through his veins, as far as I'm concerned. So she starts this relationship with Ship. And he is, from the get-go, very physically abusive. He's very controlling. He's nasty. But remember, as far as Pike is concerned, he shows her attention. He finds her attractive. He wants her. Yeah, he beats her up. Yeah, he's really abusive towards her. But at the end of the day, that makes him really protective. Just bear that in mind. Physically violent men, 
can to the girl who's endured the most horrendous experiences growing up also seem like somebody that in certain situations when they were under threat would intervene and protect them. It's a complete mismatch with reality, but that's what Pike is seeing. She's building this bias that, oh, he's not really too bad. He's better than the horrible men that I've been around before. At least he isn't raping me. These are things that will go through her mind. As far as she's concerned, he's the first person that actually cares for her after her grandmother dies. You know, she's not had that care since. And she just becomes more and more desperate to please him. She's absolutely obsessed with him. She's infatuated with him. And remember her age frame as well. This is a young woman who hasn't experienced love apart from that small pocket with her grandmother that's probably been absolutely destroyed by all these other horrible experiences and here we have as far as she's concerned a hero who's seen her and likes her and suddenly she's completely connected and she wants it to work out and she's only a kid and when you're only a kid you don't have a lot more going on in your life you focus and fixate and that certainly happens as far as she's concerned. Let's also remember the damage that's going on in her brain. She's not necessarily computing relationships in the way that you or I would, simply because it will feel very, very overwhelming for her. Remember, that frontal lobe damage will certainly have an impact. Now, SHIP is known at the centre where they're already obviously considered troubled kids and young people. He's known to be a problem. He's known to be somebody who's as they put it, dangerous and uncooperative. Not great. Not a great description. Uncooperative isn't great, but dangerous and uncooperative, that really disturbs me. Because if you're somebody who won't cooperate with me when you might be learning or growing or developing, but also you're going to potentially threaten me because you don't really have consequential thinking, that puts people in danger. Certainly would put a member of staff in danger. And apparently he'd even at one point tried, tried, didn't succeed, but nonetheless tried to throw another student 200 feet up a railway bridge. Genuinely, that actually happened. Could somebody please bring the van, take the child, put them in the centre and do some really intensive therapy for, I don't know, 25 years? Just throwing it out there. But you can imagine what that says about this young man's character to literally want to try to throw another student 200 feet off a railway bridge. That's terrifying. You ain't trying to cause a little bit of an injury. You're not trying to sprain someone's ankle. You're not trying to teach them a lesson. You're trying to smash them into pieces and kill them. End of. Now, as I've said, they're at this job corpse centre. This is meant to be about helping these troubled young people. But actually, on reflection staff stated it was just a really dangerous environment it was not a well environment for anybody not for the students not for the staff it was full of gang members it had really serious issues with bullying and drug use so no disrespect that is a complete lack of appropriate staff there you know there are people who are in gangs there are people who take drugs but there is a clear veto of that kind of behavior in these kind of projects there is a clear code of behavior and boundaries because my god these young people need boundaries more than the average child so if you aren't giving them them and you're allowing them to run riot you're just compounding the behaviors that are causing them problems in their lives but this is going on I appreciate when you work in youth work or you work in rehabilitation, probation, working with young people, it can feel quite scary at times because you get some very strong characters, but the reality is you have to protect the environment and the staff. And even if that means removing strong characters from the place, you do that as opposed to let them be in control. It's not good for anybody. It's certainly not good for the staff who are at risk, but it's not good for the kids because the message is you rule the world, you're in charge. This is how the world will work for you. No, it won't. You'll end up in prison. It's as simple as that. You can push the boundaries as much as you like, but one day you're going to push it hard and it's going to have terrible consequences for you. So you have to be clear in these environments that there are rigid standards, more so than in other environments, to protect the integrity of the group, but also protect the integrity of what your attempts to do are about, which is to help these young people grow and develop and live more pro-social lives. But no, there are literally drugs flying about. The students are armed with knives, even firearms. Just sounds like a hellhole. Sorry, if you were like, well, you can have this job, 
yeah, I really want to work with kids. You can have this job then. It's a great job with kids. There's a lot of kids. And what kind of behavior is there? It's, it's bad behavior. Well, okay, I'm trained in managing young people and conflict and young people's behavior and making sure that they behave appropriately. Yeah. I mean, what you'll find is if you try to do that, they might shoot you. I don't think that was in the job description. We don't have it in the job description. Also, you may be sold drugs often. I'm just going to back out slowly from this building now. Just going to back out. Back out. Bye. That would literally be the reaction of a sensible human being because no one wants to be in an environment like that, let alone the young people who are meant to be there to be protected so they can grow and develop. Also, as far as Ship is concerned, he did regularly carry a gun. I also appreciate that some of you will be out there saying, well, Emma, if they're in a gang, of course, they're carrying a gun or a knife because their life is at risk too. Appreciate that. But you know what? You're not coming into my centre. Simple as that. You can carry a knife. You can carry your gun. You can carry your drugs. Not in my centre. You get out. And I let other kids who are struggling, who are going to abide by those boundaries because that's how I'm going to have the most impact. All that will happen is the kids like that will drag the project and the staff down. It's a really bad recipe for everyone. Also, if Ship wasn't bad enough because he's getting involved in the gangs and he's carrying guns and dealing drugs, he's also known to beat up other students. Yes, I think it's pretty obvious that we can assume that Ship used to be violent towards other students. After all, he did try to throw one off a bridge 200 feet up. Not very difficult to imagine. Violence was part of his MO. So anyway, we have a real recipe for disaster now, don't we? Because we've got Pike and we've got Ship and they're obviously attracted to each other. Ship is very violent. He's very controlling. And if that's not bad enough with all of the history and background that I've talked about so far, let's just introduce another key ingredient of this relationship. Satanism. I mean, I don't know what kids bond over these days. I imagine Satanism is just a standard thing on a Friday date, isn't it? What are you interested in? Well, I like arm um, reading. I like the idea of some risk taking. I'd like to do a skydive. I like pets. I like animals. I've got lots of pets. And I also on a Thursday like Satanism. A little bit of sacrifice. Just, just sacrifice. Just on a Thursday. Unbelievable. On a Wednesday, that's what I do every single week, 7.30 till 10.30 p.m. every single week. If I'm not sacrificing something, I'm not doing my Satanism well. I kid you not. Satanism. Now, genuinely, I was a goth. I'm still a recovering goth. Look at my eyes. Not around the eyes, look into the eyes. You're under. You're not really. I'm not trying to hypnotize you there, sorry. Some of you won't even have seen that series. I was just pretending that I was a hypnotist, but not a very good one in the series. I'm trying to actually reenact there. But basically, I was a goth. I had the black hair, I had the long black skirts with the tassels, had all of it. But I'm telling you now, when I was at those goth clubs, if somebody had been like, do you want to go out on a date? And I was like, yeah, I totally want to go out with a date because you've got a really cool black leather jacket and you've got really loads of black eyeliner on, which is more than I'm wearing. You know, I had a respect for guys like that. If they were like, oh, great, because like, I'm totally into goth culture and I love Satanism, I'd be like out of the door straight away. Just because you're interested in subcultures, like gothic subcultures, does not make you interested in Satanism. It's a really weird thing. It's bizarre. And there are defenders of Satanism out there. Oh, it's not really just about child sacrifice. It's not really just about malevolence and spells and casting things and incantations. It's not really just about that. Kind of is, though. It kind of is. You know, the devil is kind of known for not being the best kind of chap in the world. You know, if you're going to ask me where I want to go, up or down, it's up. It's up. Because down, I think there's a lot of people I wouldn't want to share cells with. Anyway, I digress. I digress. But anyway, these two, they love the idea of Satanism. And Ship is actively practicing it. So we're not talking about, I want to look cool, I want to look interesting, I want to look a little bit different. I like Satan, but actually I don't know anything about it. Ship is actively involved in practicing it. So Pike is desperate. She wants to be loved. She wants to be liked. So she is really eager to please him and she develops this interest in it. You know, she ups her game. 
she becomes more, shall we say, active in that area. Like I said, whereas most of us would be running for the hills, throwing women and children behind us as we tried to escape this individual, the truth is for her, he shows interest in her. If it had been somebody who loved rock climbing, Pike would have loved rock climbing. If it had been somebody who absolutely adored volunteering, you can bet your bottom dollar she would have turned up volunteering every day with a smile on her face because it had a connection to the person that she's interested in. And it's a shame, isn't it, that in a world where she could have met somebody decent, she meets him. And that's why I've come down so hard on this particular environment that they're in because Pike should not be being exposed to this kind of person. It is clearly going to have very damaging impact on her. She should be protected from it. Now we get to early January 1995 and Ship actually has a conversation with a friend and says that he intends to make a human sacrifice. It's very disturbing because this kid is actually into and practicing to some degree Satanism. He's also in a gang, so we see the intention is possible. And also he's also tried to kill somebody by throwing them off a bridge. We can see this. This is not looking good. And the fact that he's very open about the fact that he wants to do it, again, low consequential thinking. The more people you tell, the more likely you are to actually get found out. Also, it's said that he had a Ouija board and he had that with him when he was talking to his friends about this human sacrifice. And he claimed that he wanted to make this human sacrifice at that point because the celestial bodies were in alignment. Very mystical. I mean, the very fact that he's carrying around a Ouija board is deeply disturbing, isn't it? I mean, why would you wander around with a Ouija board? I know it sounds very 1980s and 1990s. For any of you who went to school then, I imagine that you had those moments where you were like, let's just do a Ouija board. What could possibly go wrong? I don't know. Maybe opening another dimension and inviting horrible beings and entities in. But we're 13, who cares? That was the kind of thing you got up to. I remember doing it quite a few times with friends, becoming completely panic stricken that I'd introduce some kind of telephone wire connection between this dimension and that dimension. And I was probably going to be overtaken like the person in The Exorcist. Some would say that may have happened and I just never realised. So getting back to the actual crime that plays out, because I think it's so essential that I tell you about that really dysfunctional backdrop that Pike has endured. And it's at this point with this whole dysfunction at the center that she's at, as the guy that she's with, the background she's experienced, that she ends up crossing paths with another student at the Job Corpse Center. And that student is 19 year old Colleen Slemmer. And I would say, from the get-go essentially there is some friction between the two young women but the friction is not from Colleen that's not what she's doing it's Pike because Pike is absolutely convinced from the get-go that Colleen is interested in having sex with Ship her boyfriend I mean with respect somebody should have sat Pike down and been like I'm just gonna go through a few points Pike as to why Colleen won't be interested in your boyfriend. I mean, with a list. One, gang member. Two, violently abusive. Three, deeply controlling. Four, carries around a Ouija board. I mean, that's just weird. Five, tried to throw a student 200 feet off a bridge. And six, keeps talking about human sacrifice. And that's just for starters, sweetheart. But no, bear in mind, Pike thinks that everybody would be interested in this boy because she wants him and she's so obsessed by him and anything that she imagines is going to cause an issue between her and him is going to be a big amplified problem and bear in mind her thinking processes they are already impaired and i have to let you know now that colleen is not interested at all in her boyfriend she is not interested whatsoever in ship it's all made up in pike's head so we get to 11th of January 1995 and on this day Pike is obviously in a pretty bad mood and she tells her friend who's a fellow student that she wants to kill Colleen. She tells a girl called Kim Lolio that she wants to kill Colleen and she said that she just felt mean that particular day. Now Kim is struggling to some degree but she's typical. She knows that that's not appropriate but she just thinks it's all talk. But then the next day, it's around 8 p.m. in the evening, she actually sees Pike, Ship 
and Colleen, along with this other student, who's an 18 year old called Shadola Peterson. And the walking away from the Job Corp Centre, that obviously strikes a chord because she's thinking, well, why are you with Colleen when you clearly told me you don't like her and you think that she wants your boyfriend and that you want to hurt her stroke kill her? And she watches them as they walk away from the Jobs Corp Centre. And then about 10, 15 p.m. approximately, the same evening, she sees Pike, Ship and Peterson and they're returning, but there's no sign of Colleen. And that kind of strikes her as odd. But it gets even worse because later that night, Pike actually arrives at Kim's room and she just says, I've killed Colleen. And she even says at that point that she'd kept a piece of Colleen's skull as a souvenir. And she actually shows Kim this piece of skull. She even says to her that she'd cut Colleen's throat six times. She said she'd beaten her, she'd thrown asphalt at her head. And she even goes so far as to say that Colleen had begged her to stop, but she'd carried on. Because as Colleen kept talking, it was making it difficult, so she wanted to shut her up. Then Pike even further goes on to describe the attack and says she'd used a meat cleaver on Colleen's back. She'd used a box cutter on her throat. They'd carved a pentagram onto Colleen's chest. Now, Kim at this point must have been thinking, please be making this crap up. Please just be fantasizing. Please just be absolutely exaggerating this position because it sounds so far outside the realms of reality. Bear in mind, Pike is her friend. She's not seen this kind of behavior before. And Kim said one of the things that was probably most disturbing was the way that Pike was when she was actually relaying the details to her. So apparently she was dancing in a circle, she was smiling when she was saying it, and she was going, la, la, la. And it's just really disconcerting for Kim because she can't figure out why you would be in this way if you'd actually carried out that kind of a killing. But then she doesn't do anything about it. She's probably hoping it's all made up. And it's actually the next morning which is when they're at breakfast, that Kim asks what Pike had done with the fragment of skull. So it's playing on her mind. She probably wants evidence that this is real. And Pike actually says, it's in my pocket. And then she said, yeah, I'm eating breakfast with it. It's really macabre, isn't it? Really grotesque to imagine that moment and where Kim's head probably was. Because trying to imagine that what we're talking about is real in that moment for somebody like Kim, would be so far outside the expectations of her life and the experience that she's had to that point. And seeing somebody that you're friendly with and imagining them that they're a cold-blooded killer, it's a really big stretch to make, particularly when you're a young person. Later that morning, Pike can't contain herself, essentially. Remember that poor impulse control? She's not a consequential thinker. Well, you can see that. She's so unsophisticated because she's literally telling people what she did. So she says to another student about the fact that she's caused great harm to another human being because she points at her shoes and says, that ain't mud on my shoes, that's blood. So she again is really excited by this. And just like she'd done earlier on, she showed the student the fragment of Colleen's skull and claimed that Colleen's blood and brains had been pouring out. It's a horrific description. So although at this point she's actually gone ahead and she's disclosed this information of an apparent murder to two students, it wasn't actually reported to the police. Now, I will say that that's not unusual. We see it time and time again in murder scenarios where the actual people who are told of these horrendous crimes keep it to themselves. I suppose arguably we can say, well, there's a level of code of conduct, don't snitch. But also I think it's too big for people to believe. Somebody that you like, somebody that you connect with, somebody that you've trusted until that point has told you that they brutally murdered somebody. You just want to think they're making it up. And also there's a bit of you that might think my life could be under threat if I dare to talk about this. I mean, after all, if they killed one person, why couldn't they kill another? But they don't go to the authorities and actually tell them that this has occurred. And it's not until the following morning, which is the 13th of January, 1995, that 
Colleen's bloodied and battered body is essentially discovered. It's found by an employee of the University of Tennessee Grounds Department, which must have been absolutely incomprehensible. And I don't often expose myself to really grotesque crime scene pictures. I really don't because I think that it's one of those things that you can't help but carry. And I tend not to engage with that kind of material. But because of the fact that these were young people and because I had access to them and I could kind of think about the last moments of the girl's life that we're going to talk about, I almost felt like I needed to do so. And I cannot even begin to contemplate how horrific it would be for that particular individual who found her body because there are traumatic crime scenes and then there is this and we're talking about a really young girl and the dehumanization and essential eradication of her as a human being the execution of her but also the distortion of her body and the stealing the opportunity for her family to actually be able to say goodbye to her we all want the opportunity, whether we take it or otherwise, to be able to go and kiss somebody that we love goodbye before they actually get buried or cremated. This was never going to be an option for the family of this girl. Never. And this person finds her. She's lying face down on debris. She's actually naked from the waist up. And this is on the agricultural campus. So at first, because there are animals around, it's an agricultural campus, he thinks it's the corpse of an animal and wants to go and investigate because it's like, my God, what's happened to this blooded animal? Look, it's like something terrible has befallen it. But then as he moves closer, he sees an exposed breast and then he sees clothes and suddenly he's realizing this isn't an animal. This is a woman's body. So immediately he calls the emergency services, the police come out, they get there very quickly and they know that the victim's body is literally just soaked in blood, it's covered. But what is really alarming and disturbing and utterly blindsiding for the officers who investigated that scene is that her body is so mutilated that when they're looking at her, they literally can't be sure if they're looking at the victim's face or the back of her head. She had suffered so grotesquely, so brutally in this crime and killing. She'd suffered multiple slash wounds to her throat. She'd had a rag tied around her neck. And when I tell you that her skull had been completely shattered, I mean, it had literally been completely shattered. It's unbelievable to look at. They also noted that the top half of the body was just covered in cuts and bruises. And because of that, they could also tell that there had initially at least been a struggle. And they could also see that it had been a really prolonged attack. When they were able to establish the crime scene and how things had played out, they could see that the crime itself had covered an area of about 100 feet by 60 feet. So we're not talking about a crime occurring in one space. We're not talking about an individual overpowered and murdered in that moment, in that place. We're talking about a protracted, drawn out execution where the victim is either moving or being moved. It's harrowing. They could see that plants and bushes had all been trampled over. There were drag marks in the mud. There was this really large pool of blood around 30 feet from the body. They found bloody chunks of asphalt and they found leaves literally dripping in blood. Quote, that's taken specifically from the research, dripping in blood. When they actually took the body in for forensic examination, they obviously cleaned the body because it was so covered in blood when they were initially viewing it and what I've talked about so far is grotesque and disgusting and despicable enough that the injuries were so enormous but that was nothing that was nothing because of course the blood had distorted the actual injuries you couldn't see a lot of them but when they clean the body they find even more sinister information on it so they find the pentagram that's been very crudely carved into her chest and they can see how many of these horrific injuries have been protracted and inflicted 
Now, obviously, now a murder investigation is immediately launched and the police go to speak to students at the Job Corp Centre. Pike and a boyfriend, Ship, they're both interviewed. This is about two days after the actual killing. They're interviewed separately at this point. One of the things that draws the police's attention immediately is they're both wearing distinctive pentagram necklaces. I know, you may have thought, I don't know, I've just murdered somebody horribly. I've inscribed a pentagram on the poor victim's body. What I should probably do is wear a pentagram because that will mean that nobody connects me potentially with the crime. I mean, Satanists are everywhere, aren't they? If I'm not walking down a corridor with 60 other people who are clearly Satanists, I don't know where I am, usually Tesco. All I'm saying is clearly not very sophisticated. So they notice these pentagram necklaces are very distinctive. And Pike, who's carried out this horrific murder, doesn't deny it. In fact, I would say that Pike both happily and excitedly confesses to everything. And wow, she does not miss a detail. She describes exactly what's happened to Colleen. She told the police that there'd basically been this ill feeling between her and Colleen for quite a long time. She accused her of running her mouth off. She accused her of going after her boyfriend. And this, as far as she is concerned, was enough to carry out that killing. Now bear in mind, Pike at this point at the centre, she was actually on her last warning for violent behaviour. So there had been problematic issues with her previous to this. But we're talking about an escalation that is uncanny, aren't we? We're talking about something that hasn't been symbolic in her behaviour till this point. This is an execution, a protracted violent execution. And she just admits it. So she claims that Colleen had been trying to provoke her. Of course, that's what she wants to do. She wants to have a bias that there's a reasoning behind it. She said she'd been trying to provoke her to get her actually finally thrown out of the programme. Now let's just go for Colleen was doing that. I mean, she wasn't, but let's say that she was. Let's say Colleen was trying to sleep with a boyfriend, which she wasn't, but let's just say she was. How would that warrant or justify what I told you so far? How could Pike have a mindset that enables her to believe that she has a just cause to absolutely decimate this poor young girl? But in Colleen's mind, that's absolutely the right that she has. So Pike tells the investigators, who obviously will be open-mouthed at this point, because my God, this horrific slaying has occurred. This is straight out of a horror movie, right? This is straight out of what you see in the movies when they're trying to put forward a satanic plot line. The police are not used to this. And probably when they saw her body, they thought it was highly unlikely they were dealing with a female. If you think about this kind of brutal slaying, 99% of the time, it's a male to female crime. I know that we have a male involved in this, of course, we have ship, but the point is the violence being bestowed is by a girl on the whole. So with respect, the investigators would not be expecting that. Yeah, maybe telling them that ship had done it, but not her acknowledging and actually in detail going through and describing firstly what she did and also why she did it. So ultimately bang to rights. They haven't had to work hard for this confession. So she's going through all of these issues and talking about how she lured the victim to her death. So around 8.50 p.m. on the 12th of January, 1995, she recalls that what she did was get Colleen to go to Blockbuster Music Store with her and with also some other individuals, as we know. At that point, she refuses to name the other individuals. Now, we all know, and it was soon established by the investigators that this is Ship and Peterson. Now, what really breaks my heart at this moment in time is we have Colleen innocently going with Pike to Blockbuster because she's probably thinking, thank God, this girl is scary. This girl's violent. This girl's had an issue with me. And now she's asking me to go to Blockbuster with her. Hey, maybe this is a new opportunity. Maybe we are going to be friends. Maybe she's forgiven me for whatever thing that she's created in her head. Maybe we're going to put the conflict that feels difficult and challenging and maybe a bit scary behind us. And Pike knows that. So this is the way that she can manipulate Colleen to go with her. 
I would imagine that very few people would refuse Pike because she's scary. Remember, she's impulsive. Now, they soon establish, as I said, that Ship and Peterson go with her. But until this point, she's just holding back and just saying that there's somebody that came along for the ride, so to speak. Now, on the way, she says to Colleen, oh, I've got some weed. It's hidden in the park in the University of Tennessee campus. And even goes further and says, listen, I want to make peace with you. And so Colleen is probably thinking, OK, we can have a smoke. We can have a chat. It's all going to be cool. Maybe this girl's going to be my friend from now on. But of course, what Colleen doesn't know is she's basically wandering to her death, trusting that this girl is going to be somebody that she's now got an alliance with. She has no idea that there is absolutely no weed where they're going. But what the group did have were weapons. So indeed, they had stored things. Box cutter, bought by Peterson. A small meat cleaver that Pikes borrowed from a friend. And we actually never find out who that friend was, who she borrowed the meat cleaver from. She kept it to herself. She never revealed that identity to the authorities. So she obviously has a real belief system in what's appropriate to tell the authorities. She can admit things about herself, but not necessarily admit the people who aided and abetted. So they head off to this agricultural campus and it's here that Pike confronts Colleen about this apparent romantic interest that she has in ship. And the two begin to argue, of course they do, because Colleen's going to defend herself. I'm not interested in this weirdo that you're with. I'm not interested in this strange satanic man. I'd literally rather date a goat. You know, she's going to be fighting back with that respect because this is unexpected. She thought that they were going to hang out with each other. They were going to have a smoke. And this is at the point that Pike actually launches into this frenzied, grotesque attack. First of all, she starts slapping and punching Colleen. And then she starts to repeatedly knead Colleen in the head. Then she throws her to the ground. And then she just starts repeatedly kicking her, slamming her head against the concrete. And all the while, Colleen is apparently saying, why are you doing this to me? Now, at one point, Pike claimed that the reason that she got even angrier was that Colleen had basically threatened to report her to the Job Corps program. And she said that that angered her even further. I doubt that that actually happened. But even if she had actually used this as a threat, well, it's understandable because you're thinking, my God, I've got to stop this attack. Maybe if I let her know that if she doesn't stop, because you're thinking at this point, I'm just going to get beaten up. If she doesn't stop, I'm going to have to report her. Maybe that will stop the behaviour. Now, we all know that with Pike, she's very poor at consequential thinking. She's highly impulsive. It's not really going to make a difference. But even if that were the case, it just does the opposite. If she did try to threaten that for Pike, that's a further threat. So she just gets even more and more and more angry. I'm not saying it happened, by the way. I probably doubt it did. I think that Pike's just looking for reasons to pin the reaction on this poor defenseless woman. So Pike is just repeatedly kicking her in the face. She's kicking her in the side. And after this horrifically initial brutal assault, Colleen's apparently lying on the ground and crying. And you'd think that would be it, right? Okay, we've had our fun. We've taught this girl a lesson. We've let her know, don't go near my boyfriend. But they were far from finished with her. They were just warming up. This isn't making them dampen down what they feel. We're looking at pack mentality now, or they're all excited, they're all interested, they're all dehumanizing this girl. Poor Colleen. She staggers up to her feet. She tries to run away, but Ship runs after her. He trips her over. She falls over, she hits her head on a rock. And then Ship holds her down until she stops struggling. She can't force that to change because he's stronger than her. He's a male. He's physically dominant. When it comes down to a male and a female, even if he was smaller and slighter, he's still going to be stronger. And in this case, that's not the case. He is more dominant. He is more physically capable. So she gives up. And then he drags her back to her attacker, to the main attacker. It's just a short distance. Now, at some point, they want to humiliate her. So they tell her to take off her top and her bra because they don't want her to escape again. And they feel that if they do this, she will be captive. She won't want to be seen running half naked. But it's also about control, isn't it? It's also about letting her know that they can do anything that they want to her. It's also sexual. Think about that. 
you're actually making somebody expose their chest to you. And for a girl, that's incredibly upsetting and incredibly violating. At this point, when they feel they've even further controlled her, Pike just starts again. She starts the assault. She starts to cut her stomach with a meat cleaver. And apparently Colleen is screaming and screaming. But does that deter Peterson and Ship? Do they think, hey, this is going wrong. This is getting really bad. We need to jump in and stop Pike from doing this. No. They just join in. They stab her with the box cutter. And she was slashed and she was stabbed countless times. Now, according to Pike, Pike reckoned that at that point during the attack, she started hearing voices in her head. And the voices are actually saying to her, you're going to go to prison for attempted murder. I mean, the voices were wrong because she's going to go to prison for actual murder. But isn't it intriguing that this girl who has got such poor impulse control, the conscience starts to talk to her. She can see it as an out of body experience, a different party, a voice in her head that she wasn't controlling, but actually it's the voice of conscience. It's the voice of reason saying, look, you carry on with this, you're gonna go to prison for attempted murder. But like I said, there's no way that Colleen was ever gonna walk away from this alive. And this voice says, unless you do something about it, you're going to end up with these horrendous consequences inside. But Pike said, when she hears that voice, she's just at the point where she's just watching Colleen bleed. Now, despite the horrific, and they are horrific injuries at this point, Colleen actually manages to roll over. She gets herself to her feet and she tries to escape again. But bear in mind, she's running away now. She's got no top on, her back's exposed. And Pike just uses this as an opportunity to slice all the way down her back with a meat cleaver. She opened her back up. The injury that Pike actually referred to when she was describing it as the big, long cut. We're talking about a young girl. Can you imagine the terror, the fear pumping through her veins as her body is violated and aggressed and attacked again and again and again and the injuries are serious and severe. I can't even begin to imagine how that girl was feeling. She was a mere child with respect. But in spite of that, she's trying again and again to get up and run. She's a warrior. That survival instinct, it doesn't matter how badly injured she is, she still has that feeling of needing to escape. She's not giving up. And she even starts to beg for her life. She pleaded with Pike to just talk to her, said if they let her go, she will literally walk back to her home in Florida and will never return. She said, I'll never even collect my belongings, just let me go. And Pike actually said in response to that, shut up. And the reason that she actually told her to shut up is she explained it was harder to hurt her when she was talking to her. So she actually realizes that when she is seeing Colleen as a human, as a young woman, it's difficult for her. So she wants her to be quiet so she can be an object, so she can hurt that object. At some point, she's so annoyed by the fact that Colleen is speaking, she actually gags her with a rag that she used as a hairband, and that's to try to stop her talking. And the more that Colleen tries to talk, the more that Pike kicks her in the face to try to shut her up. Now, at one point, Colleen actually managed to ask Pike what she was going to do to her. And Pike said it was then that she thought she heard a noise. So she thinks, oh my God, is somebody here? And she actually pauses. She goes around, looks around, and you think that maybe at that moment in time with that voice in your head saying, you're going to go to prison for attempted murder, and then you're thinking, oh, we're going to get disturbed. Is somebody going to find us doing this? Maybe we should leave. But no. Pike cools down, goes and looks, checks that no one else is around, and then returns to finish the job. Now that demonstrates something different to what we've been talking about. We can argue to all intents and purposes that this young woman has poor consequential thinking and terrible impulse control, but she can stop, she can go and check out the area, and she can figure out whether somebody else is around, whether she's going to get disturbed. That shows an absolute ability to control behaviour. She's not in a frenzy. She's thinking about 
whether somebody can discover what she's done. And she's able to go and do that. That's not a problem with uncle's control, is it? That isn't. That's her being very aware and trying to prevent being caught at that moment in time. She returns then as if Colleen hasn't had enough, right? And she just begins to repeatedly slice her throat with this box cutter. And horrifically, and I mean this because, don't get me wrong, I want Colleen to live. We all want Colleen to live. But think about what she's gone through so far. And yet, even though this has been going on for such a long time, she's still, in spite of having a throat cut with a box cutter and having her back carved up and having her head almost caved in through this attack, she's still alive and she's still begging for her life. Despite the fatal injuries that was inflicted on her, Colleen was talking throughout. She was even trying to sit up. And each time she tried to sit up, Pike and shit would just push her down, smash her down. And even at this point, Colleen attempted to run away. At this point, Pike threw a rock at her head, struck the back of her head, and Ship also hit her in the back of the head with a rock. When Colleen fell down to the ground, Pike just started hitting her again and again, repeatedly hitting her around the head with this really large piece of asphalt. It shattered her skull. And then Peterson starts to join in. She's hitting Colleen with a brick. And in the end, Colleen is literally breathing blood in and out. And she was jerking. And despite this, despite the obvious fatal injuries that had been inflicted, Pike just carried on, just maintained this frenzied attack, just kept hitting her and hitting her again and again in the head, particularly. And at one point, Pike even asked the dying teenager, Colleen, do you know who's doing this to you? By this point, Colleen could literally only make gurgling and groaning noises. Pike and Ship then each grabbed one of her feet, dragged her still alive near some trees. And at that point, according to Pike, Ship used a box cutter to carve a pentagram into her chest. Before they vacated that area, before they left Colleen to die, they threw her clothes into the bushes, just left her on a pile of dirt and debris to finally take a last breath. It's quite incomprehensible, isn't it, what I've just described? That actually happened to a young girl, a completely innocent young girl who just caught the attention of an intensely jealous young woman. Following that killing, Pike and Ship basically go and wash the hands and shoes in a mud puddle, but they were covered in blood. But this is their attempt at cleaning themselves up. Pike then disposes of the box cutter and then later she returns the meat cleaver that she borrowed from the unidentified friend. She tells the police who at this point are completely stunned because it's in such detail and she's not hidden away from the reality of what she's done. She says that she had been wearing jeans. She told them they were in her room. She told them she'd rubbed mud from her shoes into them because she wanted to attempt to hide the blood. And Pike actually goes on to retrace the steps for the investigators and take them to the exact location where Colleen's body's been found. This girl isn't going to get away with it. She doesn't even intend to get away with it. She's quite happy to tell the investigators exactly how it's played out. When Pike's asked to give an estimate as to how long the actual beating and killing took, she said it was between 30 minutes and 45 minutes. If any of you have ever been in scary situations and 30 seconds is too long, if any of you have had to endure beatings or found yourself in a street fight and been abused in that way, a minute is a lifetime. I don't even know where to begin envisaging and imagining the kind of agony and the terror that you would endure for 45 minutes. Even worse, and it's hard to say even worse when I'm talking about a case like this, because I don't know how it can be. But the autopsy was able to establish that Colleen would have been alive for the entirety of the assault I've just described. She was alive. 
The actual cause of death from the autopsy, they said it was a combination of a massive, massive head trauma, but also blood loss. And how she had died was she'd effectively choked to death on her own blood. It's physically and psychologically one of the most horrific ordeals that I think I've ever described on this channel. She would have known for a very long time, according to the experts, that they were going to kill her. Kaleem's arms, her body, her face were literally covered in so many slashes, so many stab wounds, that the pathologist gave up trying to catalogue them all. It's the first time I've ever looked at a pathologist report and they literally admit to that. They gave up. There were too many to catalogue. So in the end, they decided that they were just going to catalogue the most serious, of which there were many, so many. She had a six inch gaping wound across the middle of her neck. And that actually was so deep that it penetrated the fat and muscles of the neck. Also the area around that, there were countless wounds. And because the wounds were red, it indicated that Colleen's heart was beating when they were inflected. So she was aware of them. They found blood in the sinus cavities and that indicated that she'd been breathing all the while. Colleen's head had been absolutely horrifically mutilated. I've not put the crime scene photographs up here. For those of you with a strong stomach, you can certainly look them up. I haven't because I don't want to leave that image of Colleen with you. I want you to remember as the beautiful young girl that she was, but Mutilated is probably the biggest understatement ever, but I don't know how else to describe it to you. She had these extensive multiple skull fractures. So bad was the result of this beating that she couldn't be identified by anything other than her dental records. They had a major fracture of her head that was to the left side of her head. And I think that was likely to have been caused according to what they found. And also it makes sense when you listen to what Pike says about how they beat her up, that that was probably caused when the asphalt block was thrown onto it. And the impact had actually also fractured the right side of the skull. It had been so violent that a portion of her skull had actually been embedded in her brain. And there were bits of asphalt that were also embedded into her skull. And she was alive for this. She was alive for all of this. And they, during the autopsy, they made a decision that they wanted to remove the entire head and brain because they wanted to be able to reconstruct the shattered skull. And that's what they did. They reconstructed it because of the police investigation. They wanted to make sure that the prosecution was appropriate and they wanted to be able to look at the shattered skull. And when they reconstructed it, there was a single piece missing. And that fragment of that skull that was missing, that was recovered from Pike's coat pocket. It was a perfect fit. She carried that as a memento, as a trophy. When they took blood samples from the clothes Pike and Ship had been wearing during the attack, they obviously forensically tested them. And of course, they were a complete match for Colleen's DNA. Obviously, they're trying to really make sure that they get a proper conviction here. They want to have them bang to right. So it's really important that even though they've got a confession of Pike, they additionalize it with the DNA forensics. Now, we can absolutely acknowledge that Pike, during at least the beating, she was the ringleader. She absolutely was. But Ship and Peterson, they were not innocent bystanders during this attack at all. Just bear that in mind because you're going to be shocked by something. You really are. Now, during the subsequent murder trial, Peterson, she actually testified that Ship played a major role in the killing. So we've got Pike, who's obviously massively involved. She's absolutely beating and assaulting this poor girl beyond belief. But Ship, according to Peterson, is the person who's actually directing a lock of it. So the commission of the offence is happening because Pike is essentially coordinating the attack. Also, she said that Ship was the person who carved the pentagram into Colleen's chest. Now, Pike may have needed very little encouragement. I'm not going to deny that. But without a doubt, Ship was absolutely instrumental and a huge part of the attack on this poor girl. Now, Peterson, they definitely joined in as well. 
they got involved in the slashing, in the stabbing of Colleen with the box cutter and the beating her with a brick. So Peterson is squealing and screaming out that she was not as bad as the others because clearly there is a reasoning behind wanting to be seen as less guilty. But she was slashing and stabbing Colleen with the box cutter. She was beating her with a brick. Remember that, keep that in mind. It's very important. It's heinous. It's absolutely murder. You are involved in the commission of a murder. I don't care what you're talking about, who you're saying did the worst, you're there. My God, in the States, there have been cases where somebody has gone to a party with another party and the person they went with kills somebody and they end up in prison for life because they were there. They were part of it. They were guilty simply by being in the presence of the murderer. And I'm saying that now because of what I'm going to talk about shortly. So we get to March 1996 and then we're at the point where they're deliberating over the actual verdict. And of course, the jury find Pike guilty of the only thing they could have ever found Pike guilty of, which is first degree murder. She's 100% guilty of first degree murder, without a doubt. Also, they find her guilty of conspiracy to commit first degree murder, because as far as they were concerned, it's planned. Now, when we get to the sentencing stage of trial, Pike's bloody attorney does the worst job ever of presenting evidence and mitigation. Bear in mind, that's what you're going to look at. You want to look at mitigating factors. You want to look at aggravating factors. And we are not going to excuse Pike any way, shape or form at all. She is horrible. But my God, if I was her lawyer, I am going to have a list as long as my arm regarding mitigating factors. So long. They're going to have to take half a day whilst I describe how this child grew into this young adult. There is a lot of mitigation, but no, did an awful job of it. May as well not have bothered. So Pike ends up ultimately being sentenced to death by electrocution. Bear in mind at this point, she was literally only a few months past her 18th birthday when she committed the crime. So if she'd been 17, she wouldn't have ever been eligible for the death penalty. A few days after she gets this sentence, which is obviously one that means that her life will be ended, she ends up writing a letter to shit because clearly she's still absolutely devoted to this heinous human being. And it included the following. Please write me. I miss you so much. You see what I get for trying to be nice to the hoe? I went ahead and bashed her brains out so she'd die quickly instead of letting her bleed to death and suffer more. And they fucking fry me. Ain't that some shit? Please write me and tell me what you're feeling. Also, tell your lawyer if he wants me to testify for you, I will love you for the rest of my life, little devil. I can imagine Ship was thinking, oh yeah, that's exactly what I need for my defence. Bring you in. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? But again, what are you hearing in the description of those words? She's not remorseful. All she's thinking about is the relationship between him and her. And she's defensive of him. She doesn't think he's done anything wrong. In fact, she feels that she did Colleen a favour because she carried on killing her as opposed to just leaving her to suffer. It's so strange that she has that just killing in her head mindset. It's so outside the realms of reality. Now, Ship. Absolutely, beyond a shadow of a doubt, was one of the key motivating factors in that killing. Bear in mind what he said about a human sacrifice. Bear in mind the fact that he tried to kill somebody before. This is the individual who is highly malevolent, highly controlling, highly directive in the commission of this crime, but he's only 17. When Colleen died, he is 17. So he avoids automatically the death penalty, even though he's just a few months younger than Pike and they're involved in exactly the same first degree murder, he's not gonna be put to death. So he gets convicted of first degree murder and he gets sentenced to life. He'll actually be eligible for release in 2028. So there's not that long to go, whether he'll get it or not. I would hope not when you think about the level of absolute distress that he inflicted on that poor girl and also the fact that it was really calculated and premeditated but nonetheless 2028 he may get out now back to peterson back to peterson you know the girl who literally slashed colleen who hit colleen repeatedly with a brick yeah so this girl she turns police informant during the investigation so she starts to sing like a canary, lets them know exactly what happened, which with respect, 
just throwing it out there. Just throwing it out there. Is it just me? Or did they not need one? Just gonna pose that question. Because, hmm, they literally went and spoke to Pike and Pike admitted everything. Everything. Even walked the police to where it happened. The prosecution did not need an informant. They had the main perpetrator informing them. You don't need to cut a deal with somebody who brutally helped to murder a young woman. But hey, when does that stop police investigators making ridiculous deals? So, she does get found guilty. Gets found guilty to being an accessory after the fact. And you know what she got for that? Six years probation. Six years probation. If that is not an enormous injustice, is that is not a massive insult to the family of Colleen, I don't know what is. Okay, so you can brutally murder somebody, you can literally engage in slashing them, hitting them with a brick, premeditated attack, you have lots of time to intervene and try and stop it, but no, you don't bother. But you get to kind of tell people what happened, even though it's already been told by the main perpetrator, and somehow it affords you a right of not even going to prison. That is the definition, as far as I am concerned, of absolute insanity. It really is. Because the malevolence and darkness in that young person's mind and soul, that can't be managed in probation, as far as I'm concerned. And they did not pay a price for what they did. You should not be walking the streets for a very long time when you do that. This case is difficult. The reason that it's difficult is because Pike committed one of the most heinous, horrific crimes that I've talked about on this channel. She put her young victim through unimaginable suffering before she killed her. Now, on the face of it, that means that you could argue that she deserved the death penalty. If you support capital punishment, you absolutely have a right to say that. But I think what's quite difficult and conflicting about this case is that Pike was brain damaged from birth. She suffered one of the most traumatic childhoods that you, we could imagine. It's full of neglect, physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse. She was suffering from major serious untreated mental illness at the time of the offence. And I agree, mental illness does not make you a killer, but killers can also be mentally ill. And when you look, just with respect research-wise, at all the other female defendants that have been convicted of first degree murder in Tennessee, some cases, by the way, involving multiple victims, somehow they'd avoided the death sentence. Now, that means that there's a disparity in justice. So if you're gonna have justice, you have to have people treated equally under the law. So if somebody's responsible for multiple homicides and they don't get the death penalty, it's difficult to understand why she did. But for whatever reason, that balancing and levelling of justice hasn't played out in Pike's case. And part of that is probably down to the fact that it was so sensational. There was a media sensation, a media flurry around this. And also because of that awful ineffective counsel who didn't bring up the mitigating factors appropriately. And that's why the death sentences likely have been imposed. Now, bear in mind, before all of this happened, Pike had never actually received any help for her mental illnesses during her life. And there were classifications that were given to her after she was convicted. So following the trial, she was diagnosed with BPD, borderline personality disorder. Just to be clear, borderline personality disorder does not make you a torturous, murderous killer at all. Some of the best clients I've ever had are borderline personality disorder. What I will say is, they will admit perfectly and honestly that they have issues at time regulating their emotions because usually they've had horrible trauma and when you're not protected as a child, you don't know how to regulate those feelings and that can mean that you're more extreme sometimes in your reactions, but that's a hit. There's absolutely no level that we are bringing in that suggests somebody with BPD would ever cause damage to another human being, probably more likely to cause damage to themselves than others. But Obviously, that's another issue that she had to face. And certainly, as far as I'm concerned, absolutely and evidentially, according to research, comes from the horrible trauma she'd experienced. Also, she's diagnosed as bipolar. And that would, again, additionalise the highs and lows, potentially, that was going on, particularly if we're talking bipolar type 1. 
it used to be known as manic depression for those of you who are older and maybe still remember the classification as manic depression but certainly the instability that was going on would have added and made life more challenging for her particularly with all the PTSD that she was dealing with also just as an addition it's worth noting that people who have organic brain damage like Pike they often suffer from bipolar so that's in fitting again with that organic impairment I think we can all agree that those horrific traumatic experiences that she had those culminated in my opinion I'm just saying from my experience and my personal opinion they must have made her so rageful she must have had so much anger inside she must have felt so betrayed in so many ways she didn't even have her own mother acknowledge the horrific sexual assaults rapes that she endured her mother even brought predators into her home literally for pike nowhere was safe whatsoever bear in mind this internal rage then she's got this organic brain injury the impulse control issues perfect storm literally perfect storm if ever you're going to think about the perfect ticking time bomb only a matter of time that's what we're talking about where krista pike is concerned and that ticking time bomb that feeling of rage that waiting to use something or someone as a vent for it well that's what she does when she identifies Colleen as a victim she becomes the outlet for this rage and bear in mind prior to this Pike had never even been convicted of a single felony and this motivation that Pike talked about was that she believed that Colleen was going to steal a man of meaning to her I don't think that belief had any base in reality but it could certainly have motivated her to feel that she had a right because if she felt that this person was a threat to her then removing the threat was something that she believed she needed to do the idea that Colleen was trying to take the one thing that mattered to her most in her life and all she ever wanted to do wrongly and disastrously was literally impress and prove to Chip that she loved him she had no one else the fact that he was abusive and controlling well that's just more of the same that didn't matter at the end of the day she's had that all her life at least this guy's also paying her some attention and if Peterson's testimony is actually to be believed and I think we can believe Peterson's testimony as much as I think that that particular individual got off very lightly and it was wrong to let them get off so lightly I do believe that Peterson was telling the truth when she said that the whole premise of that attack was Pike trying to please ship while she was killing Colleen let's go back to that statement that ship made about wanting to have a human sacrifice so Colleen basically was a victim because he wanted a victim too and Peterson said that Pike just followed his instructions but all that said because I always want to bring balance to these I always want to kind of look at every single aspect and consider every potential avenue and understand how these individuals can end up in this situation I still think it's really difficult to be sympathetic I do I feel it's really difficult to be sympathetic to Pike if you think about the nature of the crime that we've talked about it's sadistic Pike for example, if she just wanted to murder somebody, she could have killed her quickly. Or Ship or Peterson could have just intervened and stopped it or gone for help. But instead, Colleen was just made to endure this horrific, protracted execution. It was an agonizing death. She was alive until the end. There was no care or consideration or compassion for this young person. It's complete overkill. She did far more to her than you'd ever needed to do to actually achieve a kill. Also, when they looked at the majority of the stab wounds and the slash wounds, most of them were superficial. It was done to hurt her, but not to kill her. They wanted her to suffer. And Pike wanted to dehumanise her. And when you think about the horrible attacks that Pike had suffered and endured herself, why would you choose to literally dehumanise and humiliate another girl? Why? That's sadistic. And it shows a complete detachment from the reality of the experiences that she had had that should have made her more compassionate and instead skewed her and gave her permission base to do this to another girl. They hurt Colleen to the extreme purposefully. Even told her during the attack that it was really hard when she was talking to hurt her. So again, the dehumanization element, even acknowledging it, being aware of it, 
if you're a human, if you're acting human, if you're speaking like a human, I can't do this to you and I want to do this to you. So shut up. I assume in spite of me trying to offer an understanding as to why this girl did what she did, I have to assume that Pike gained an immense and intense satisfaction of being the predator. And for me, that's actually further evidenced by the behaviour that she made when she was around her friend Kim, singing, dancing, taking a memento, that fragment of the skull. That in itself is disturbing and striking and very resonant of what we see when it comes down to people who are killers, that are serial killers. We're talking about the highest level of violent predator, of violent killer at this moment in time. And when Pike went to prison, her behavior didn't end, her violence didn't end. So following her incarceration, this is the 24th of August in 2001, she's in a maximum security unit of Tennessee prison and she attacks another inmate. Basically, they have a disagreement. There's an argument between two prisoners. You'd expect these things to be quite common in prison. Pike actually intervenes and strangles one of them with a bootlace until she is unconscious to such a degree that they actually convicted her of attempted first degree murder. So again, the violence hasn't shifted. She is still a threat. In March 2012, this gets even stranger. Authorities then discover that Pike basically made escape plans. Of course she did. Did she ask for somebody to bring in a cake with some kind of small saw in it? I don't know. It's the kind of thing I imagine. But no, this escape, and again, just going to bring in a level of unfairness here, but this escape apparently involved a prison officer, Justin Heflin, and a man who frequently visited her. You know those kind of men, Donald Cahut. Now, Heflin, the prison officer, he'd agreed to help these plan this escape in return for cash. Now, fortunately, the plan gets uncovered, but Heflin, he just loses his job, which is the bare minimum you would expect. I mean, as far as gross misconduct goes, trying to help a prisoner escape, particularly a prisoner who's been done for first degree murder and attempted murder, you would imagine that that person would need to be, I don't know, behind lock and key. But not for this particular officer. He was like, no, I'll get some money and I'll help this person who's highly dangerous escape. He loses his job. His job. Now, I think that that is a federal offence and should be tried in federal court and should be likely committed to prison. But no, somehow he walks away just without his job. But cohort the person who was helping to organize it, he got seven years inside. I don't understand that, but then when do I ever fully understand the law? It makes no sense. Make it make sense. Now, ironically, Pike wasn't even prosecuted over the incident, and I'll tell you why, because the authorities couldn't prove that she'd been an active part of the plan. <sighs> Please make it make sense, my head has just exploded. Sorry, let me go through that. Okay, so just run me through that again. Why aren't we prosecuting Pike? Okay, it's really simple. So there's this guy, Kahoot, right? And he's basically got this whole break Pike out of prison plan. And he's connected with this prison officer. And that's how it's happened. Can you just explain to me how the prison officer who knows Pike and has the interaction with Pike on a regular level, how somehow he's more connected to Kahoot, who's created this escape breakout plan. I can't explain that to you at all. What you're saying seems to make sense, but what we're saying is, at the end of the day, it's got nothing to do with Pike. Pike isn't very trustworthy though, because Pike's a first degree murderer and also an attempted murderer. Doesn't mean she'll want to escape from prison. I think that everyone wants to escape from prison. It's another good point. I'm just going to ignore it. I'm just going to say, we've sacked the prison officer. He's off to work at a completely different place without any repercussions whatsoever. And the guy who is clearly the mastermind in all of this, he's going down for seven years. And that's justice. Sorry, was the guy who dealt with that the same guy who let Peterson just walk away from probation and absolutely no prison sentence for murder? Now that's the guy. I'm adding artistic license to that. I don't 
think that was the guy. I'm just saying it doesn't make sense that she wasn't part of the active plan to escape. Now, interestingly, as I said, because everybody has a different view on the actual death sentence, currently Pike is literally the only woman who remains on a death sentence since the end of slavery. Now, understandably, as you expect in the States where there is execution potential, she continues to basically appeal against that. She doesn't want to be killed. I find it very disconcerting when I watch her occasionally interviewed because she's very clearly not remorseful. All she feels is a level of unfairness. She can't understand why her co-conspirators didn't get put to death essentially and that she did and she fixates and concentrates on that as opposed to the brutal killing of this poor young girl who had a whole life ahead of her and had it so brutally stolen in such a terrifying, protracted and heinous way. I did something horrible that is unacceptable and I realize that, but I don't deserve to die for the actions of three individuals. And I can't take full responsibility for this anymore and I won't because if I'm gonna die in here, I'm gonna die for my truth, not for my life. You know, accept me for who I am, good, bad and ugly. Ultimately, it comes down to the fact that the courts will decide whether she goes to the electric chair or if her sentence will be commuted to one of life imprisonment without parole. What I will say is it's very hard to find a lot of sympathy and empathy with Pike because she has literally never expressed an ounce of remorse for Colleen's killing. And that's disturbing. She's had time. She's had an opportunity to reflect. And the truth is, She's more concerned about what's happening to her than what she did to that poor young girl. I'd be so interested to know your thoughts. Are you feeling that she shouldn't be put to death? Are you feeling that the reality is there was enough mitigation to exclude the death penalty as a potential and that life without parole is a dutiful sentence and a correct sentence? Are you disturbed that Peterson just gets to walk away? Are you feeling that actually Ship was an individual who was instrumental in organising this? Or do you feel that with respect, she should fry? That she should fry? That she's an individual who did the crime and deserves the consequence? That finally, that impulsivity went too far? And that finally, she has to be willing to accept the consequences? Let me know your thoughts, let me know your feelings. Like I said, it's been a brutal case to cover and you can go and look at the crime scene photographs. I would just say, if you feel compelled to do so, prepare yourself, highly traumatic. And again, I don't wanna remember her that way. I wanna remember the beautiful young woman with a future that she had stolen from her and with a life that she absolutely deserved to live because no one, and I mean no one, deserves that kind of murder. Murder is a terrible thing, but I think that when you look at what happened to that poor girl, it's incomprehensible. And the truth is, if you had to take that or the electric chair, you would be strapping yourself into that chair and letting them flick the switch because that is a far more palatable way to die. Take care guys, be safe, and let me know your thoughts. See you again soon.